uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, friends all. The Conference of Paris provides a great platform to exchange views and ideas and to develop solutions to our shared global challenges. We are proud to host this conference for the sixth time. And those of you who attended last year's conference will recall how discussions focus on the measures we needed to pursue in order to prepare for a world in transition. In the context of a relatively strong and rapid recovery from the COVID pandemic, there was a fair amount of optimism. There were, of course, issues. There were ongoing risks associated with the pandemic. And inflation had already started to rise, at least partly due to the strong and rapid recovery in demand and the difficulties for supply to match that demand. Indeed, this time last year, it was the strength and the speed of the recovery that were putting pressure on supply chains and on inflation. But after two years of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's war of aggression caused another shock, imposing a very heavy burden on the world. The human costs and the worsening impacts of this war are truly devastating. First and foremost, of course, on the people of Ukraine. But through its impact on the global economy, the lower growth, the higher and more persistent inflation, and the massive implications for energy and food security, this war is also having a direct impact on people in countries all around the world. We now project global GDP growth to slow from 3.1% in 2022 to an even lower 2.2% .2 in 2023. This worsening economic outlook and these heightened tensions are a serious threat to our rules-based international order. So as the title of this year's conference rightly puts it, we are facing growing disruption. At the very moment when we needed coordinated rules-based collaboration, this is going in the wrong direction and we've got to reverse back into the right direction. Over the past years, this conference has supported collective efforts to address global challenges. Here at the OECD, we share that commitment. We will continue to promote policy measures both to confront short-term pressures and to build a stronger and sustainable recovery over the medium to long term through important structural reforms. I want to touch on three important areas for action, which you are also addressing in different sessions of the conference this year. First, we need to make progress on the so-called triple energy challenge, energy security, energy affordability, while reducing emissions. In the short term, we need supply diversification, energy efficiency, and demand side measures to tackle high gas and electricity prices and reduce the risk of shortages, especially uh, here in Europe. At the same time, we need investments in clean energy to help improve energy security, achieve energy transition goals, and ease the need to use gas as a transition fuel. Governments won't be able to finance the green transition alone either. The private sector will be crucially important for our ability to fund the massive transformation needed to reach net zero emissions. This will require governments to use development finance to attract private sector investment to developing countries, to reduce legal and regulatory barriers to private investment in their own jurisdictions, and to develop harmonized metrics and interoperable standards allowing investment projects to be assessed and readily compared. The OECD's supporting these efforts with recommendations and tools on public procurement, infrastructure governance, and investment quality. Increasing investment in low emissions technology and innovation is also going to require greater predictability to give investors the confidence that such investments are in fact profitable. A clear policy framework combining price signals and regulatory and fiscal tools is essential to achieve these objectives. 
to help countries address climate change, the OECD launched the Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches to promote ne the necessary dialogue between advanced, emerging and developing economies on an equal footing, as well as to share experiences and knowledge and data and evidence on the effectiveness, the comparative effectiveness of carbon mitigation approaches and different policies to reduce emissions. Second, we must not lose sight of the way that open markets enable the diversification of supply and demand and hence underpin resilient supply chains. Recent shocks have led governments to consider their supply chain vulnerabilities. And of course, that is entirely appropriate. But efforts to reduce trade dependencies should be considered carefully, as they may introduce new risks and economic costs. Governments can enhance their resilience and diversify supply chains by leveraging competition and market openness. The OECD works with stakeholders to enhance supply chain resilience in a way that is fully aligned with WTO commitments, focusing on four key areas. One, anticipating risk. Two, minimizing exposure. Three, building trust. And four, keeping markets open. Strengthening supply chain resilience can also support action on the other structural reform priorities. OECD guidance to policymakers and multinational enterprises on responsible business conduct is a very good example. We help businesses better understand their supply chains and to address adverse impacts from their operations on workers, human rights, the environment, the risk of bribery, consumers, and corporate governance. Third, we need to develop a coordinated, comprehensive, and sound policy frameworks in an increasingly digitalized and globalized world economy. Digital technology comes with many benefits and exciting future opportunities. It brings governments and citizens closer together, opens new economic opportunities, improves access to education, healthcare, and other services. It promotes transparency and offers great platforms for discussion and for dissent. But we also must manage the evolving risks and disruptions associated with digitalization. While the digital transformation can help support the green transition, we must also recognize its large and growing carbon footprint. Digitalization also created significant challenges for taxation, uh, privacy, uh, cybersecurity, competition, uh, de skills development. In particular, it amplified the ability of large multinationals to take advantage of tax rules and earn significant income in market jurisdictions around the world without having to pay any or only very little corporate tax in those jurisdictions. This is, of course, where the OECD helped broker a historic global agreement agreed by 137 countries and jurisdictions around the world, representing more than 90% of global GDP, which, once implemented, will make our international tax arrangements fairer and work better in a digitalized and globalized world economy. In closing, we face significant challenges from the short-term geopolitical and economic environment, which require action and uh, sensible responses, but also uh, while not losing sight of our urgent medium to long-term structural reform agenda. The OECD will continue to support global cooperation between countries, but also between the public and the private sector, just as I know the Conference of Paris will continue to do. To tackle disruption and to ensure fairer, more prosperous, more inclusive and sustainable societies for all. Thank you. Merci, euh, merci beaucoup pour, euh, merci beaucoup pour votre accueil. Merci à, à, au Forum des Amériques qui organise cette conférence, dont NG est un, est un très heureux soutien. And uh, let's move to English, just to share a, a few uh, remarks to open this uh, this edition, which indeed is taking place in a in a very different context than last year. First, we are all together. I remember uh, opening the conference last year in front of uh, an empty room. 
we are still using the hybrid mode, which is a, a great way to have uh, to maximize the number of people who can attend. But I do believe that uh, physical interaction and the ability to discuss face to face is indeed something which is uh, very, very important for uh, for us. I think these two days must be for all of us an opportunity to dialogue to share, to project ourselves in a future which is uh, indeed very, uh, very challenging. And I think it's very important as we speak uh, to reinvent the strong ties between our two continents, Americas and, uh, and Europe, within a, a world which is changing uh, very, very quickly. We have chosen this, uh, this theme for this uh, edition, Tackling Growing Disruptions. Uh, I'm not sure the French translation is uh, is as good as the uh, as the english uh, messages uh, we want to underline the fact that we are moving indeed in a in a very fast changing environment that uncertainty uh, become the new norm and that we don't have any other choice as corporate leaders than to try to adjust as quickly as possible and yes indeed a year ago the situation was uh, very very different than what we are currently facing uh, and I think that in the past uh, 12 months, the, the dialogue between Europe and the US uh, is becoming extremely important. We have set up a program with uh, a number of uh, issues that we want to discuss during this uh, intense, in, intense, sorry, two days. Let me just mention some of them, not, not all, uh, but First one, redefining dialogue. Uh, the convergence of rising geopolitical tension, the danger of climate change that becomes more and more visible, the shift in the way we look at globalization. This creates the necessity for renewed collaboration and we need indeed to find the best possible ways uh, to establish this dialogue. And again, Europe, versus the US, but in a global context, and the uh, Secretary General of OECD has already given, given us some clues on the uh, the way we should look uh, at this uh, situation. Shaping the future of investing, we see how investment strategies could bring their contribution in the creation of a world of tomorrow, and we need to understand how the changes in decision-making process could have long-term repercussions. And as a, as a corporate leader, and I see in my interaction with investors that indeed focus are changing dramatically and the, uh, the way we can align public interest and the, um, and the way private money is investing is indeed probably one of the key to achieve the challenges that we all need to achieve together. Restoring trust in supply chains. This is an everyday discussion in, uh, in a lot of industrial companies. Uh, for very different reasons than uh, the one we were already focusing on supply chain a year ago. Uh, supply constraints on supply chain is something which is indeed limiting our ability to grow. And this is something where we need to spend some time on. Tech and climate technologies could be a great ally to allow us uh, to fight climate change. And we uh, both in terms of new technologies, the ability to develop new assets which could contribute to the fight against climate change, but also in the way we can develop innovating sustainable practices. Repositioning Europe in the global power shift, European unity is key, and sometimes sometime it's being a little bit challenged these days. We might come back to, to this. Uh, but uh, the uh, ability of Europe to position itself in, in the new area of globalization, in an area where China-US relationship uh, is indeed becoming a very important driver on where the world is going. This is key for us in Europe, and I do believe that this is also extremely important for our American friends. We'll spend some time uh, also on mobility challenges in the, this time of crisis, because mobility is, uh, is key. It's the reason why we are able to come together here, and we are seeing a lot of disruptions, but also a lot of innovation helping us uh, face these challenges about mobility. And then a last theme, but which is uh, very important even in our everyday life uh, in Europe these days, energy security and making sure that we can indeed uh, bring this energy security in a world of, uh, of transition. Geopolitical risk uh, 
challenges in uh, regarding uh, climate change policies, all of this is putting uh, real pressure on the ability of government and companies uh, to bring energy security to our customers, corporate, but also individuals. And obviously, this will be another important theme of, uh, of discussion. Well, a lot of uh, very important, uh, very detailed menu and a lot of subject on which I hope this conference will bring some uh, 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 renewed level of understanding and dialogue between the various uh, parties. This year will remain the one of an unprecedented energy shock for all of us in Europe, drastically impacting economies, but also our daily lives. Energy availability and sovereignty has become a new obsession and top priority. And there is a risk that this crisis will indeed impact our decarbonization journey and the energy transition, which was already a key priority for Europe. I am absolutely convinced that the energy transition is the solution to be more resilient and less dependent. This is a response not only to the climate crisis, but also to the issue of security of supply and energy cost. And this is especially important uh, for Europe. Accelerating the transition requires us to rethink the world right down to our usages and behaviors. We need to switch to another system based on sustainable energy, and we need to do it now. Just to conclude this, uh, these remarks uh, and taking a bit of a broader point of view, what could be the main takeaways of this incredible year? First, I think a shift towards regionalization versus globalization. This is certainly not the end of globalization, but globalization will develop in the next few years, few years in a bit of a different way. War in Ukraine, the US-China rivalry are reshaping the economic ties. US has decided to um, implement very large incentive packages to continue decoupling from China. This is having obviously an impact on Europe and our ability to continue to develop our industrial footprint. In the EU, we are facing the risk of fragmentation because of a misalignment between member states, uh, leading in some cases to inefficient responses and loose frameworks. We probably all have in mind some of the decisions which were taken in the past few months regarding uh, the energy systems, where at the end of the day, the EU let member states go their own way. And I think this risk of fragmentation is very, uh, is very significant, especially as we enter in a period in, uh, in the EU where we will need uh, to rethink the design of our energy uh, systems. Uh, you know that the uh, Commission has announced an initiative to uh, uh, rethink the market design of the power market in Europe. Energy is so key that you can't uh, adjust the energy market without having an impact on the overall construction of a single market. Second takeaway, slowdown of economic growth expected both in the US and in Europe. Post-COVID and war, inflation becoming main central bank's objective with rising interest rate, uh, growing concerns about competitiveness of Europe. I was mentioning uh, it, especially in comparison to the US. Uh, all of this creates an economic environment, which is indeed very different from what we expected a year ago. Finally, the third takeaway is obviously the fact that the climate emergency is becoming so visible across the board just think of the, uh, the images we've seen during this uh, past uh, 12 months, water shortages, extreme heat, wildfires, drought. Uh, in terms of climate mitigation, very little progress at the international level. COP27 uh, was not a breakthrough in terms of uh, the way the world will be tackling these challenges. And long-term consequences of the gas crisis that we are currently facing in Europe, significant demand destruction. Part of it is good, part of it is probably not so good. Massive push for electrification. So again, happy to open this conference and to welcome you in Paris. I think that during these two days together, we will debate and rethink globalization. We will try to put into perspective the role of Europe and try to define a more inclusive, 
more balance, more responsible, and at the end of the day, more human globalization. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope these two days will be very fruitful. Thank you. Alors, merci beaucoup. Très heureux d'être ici à cette sixième édition de la Conférence de Paris. J'aimerais premièrement remercier en particulier Jean-Pierre Clamadieu pour son support pour cette conférence et surtout de co-présider le Bureau des gouverneurs avec moi-même. Merci pour votre engagement, Jean-Pierre. Euh, alors, évidemment, il est euh, pratiquement incroyable de penser que nous avons commencé la première édition des Amériques, Forum des Amériques à Montréal, en 1995. Alors, replacez-vous à ce moment et on peut se demander, est-ce qu'on n'aurait jamais rêvé même ou pensé qu'on aurait pu avoir euh, une pandémie globale à l'échelle que nous venons de vivre et que nous vivons en fait encore quand on regarde la Chine qui euh, a des gros problèmes en ce moment avec cette pandémie qui continue. Est-ce qu'on aurait pu aussi rêver qu'il y ait une guerre en Europe, sur le continent européen ah ben Moi, je peux vous dire, jamais on aurait pensé à ça dans le temps. Eh bien, je crois que... Euh, il est important de comprendre cette conférence a débuté avec l'idée de construire des liens entre le continent américain et l'Europe. Quelque chose dans le fond d'ancien, puisque l'Europe a en fait euh, son, a créé l'Amérique, si on veut, quand elle l'a découverte et l'a, la, la peuplée. Now, of course, the conference has become now much more. But this Conference of Paris, to me, is a very important symbol of growing the links between our two continents. And this Paris one in particular, being here and being able to converse together and continue to stand for what I feel are two very important symbols, which are freedom and democracy, which we take for granted today, which we're seeing more and more, as Jean-Pierre alluded to, in the fragmentation of the world and as different camps start to build uh, around the war, for instance, in Europe. It is a reminder that it is easy to fragment and easy to isolate ourselves. But I think if we stand for these, free, these symbols of freedom and democracy, they're crucial to two concepts that I think are forgotten. One is innovation and the second one is prosperity. The world has had fantastic prosperity since the Second World War, and peoples around the world, whether they want to admit it or not, have been lifted up tremendously. If you look at the poverty in China that's been lifted up and in many other countries around the world, it's been something quite extraordinary, really. And so I think that it's very important that we have these conferences, that we continue to build trust between us, that we continue to have dialogue, And we continue to even just discuss these things. And discussion, as Theodora Zeldin uh, once taught me, a great a British philosopher, starts with a very important thing, conversation. It starts with listening. And if we're able to listen and take away some ideas from these conferences, we will be much richer and much better citizens and hopefully be able to contribute. So I wish you all a good conference and look forward to chatting with many of you. Thank you. <laughs>